All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Fitnatics today. This is actually part of our uh, series, Caring for the Caregiver, part two. Um, the first part was the uh, interview with Dr. White, and I posted that, I think, about a week ago. So let's get started if you guys like, and we can, if you've watched the video, fantastic. If not, um, I'll put it on the Fitnatics Facebook page. It is on my YouTube channel, okay? And it's also posted on my social media, like Facebook and Instagram. So it's there, it's about 18 minutes or so. Um, anyone want to share any feedback, something that they learned, uh, they pull, were able to pull from that interview? Anyone, anyone? I only okay. watched part of it. <laughs> okay, got it, got it. That's fine, that's fine. Um, I must anyone? have missed it. I didn't see a link for it, so I didn't watch it. <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. What, um, basically, uh, Dr. White is a neurological uh, uh, nurse. She's got a PhD in nursing. And her field is dealing with individuals, stroke, dementia, Alzheimer, but more specifically with families, the caregivers of these individuals. And so she spoke mainly about um, the questions that I was asked from you guys. I know Cindy had asked about nutrition and supplements that uh, would be good for dealing with those types, not dealing, preventing um, those uh, neurological disorders. And um, she did address it. I don't, uh, what she said was basically, whatever is good for the heart is gonna be good for the brain. So mm -hmm. she mentioned uh, a Mediterranean uh, type of diet. Um, I can't remember. I, she mentioned another type of um, way of eating. Does anyone remember that? I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, let me bring Nancy in. But basically, whatever is good for the heart would be good for the brain. She felt as though there's not really any specific type of supplement um, that is like, oh, yes, you take this supplement and for sure you're good um, when it comes to brain health. So she didn't really hone in on that in terms of like, we got to get this. Um, some of the other highlights that I wanted to, to pull from that interview was the research that's being done and the extent of research that's being done and, and it's it's really good and what they're showing and this is you know for everybody here is the more we move the better we are when it comes to those types of brain health and um, neurological disorders and we did talk a little bit about what types of movements and so on and so forth and she really didn't say specifically, you need to have you know, a certain amount. She goes by, let me go ahead and mute real quick. She goes by the uh, American Heart Association guidelines, which are you know, 30 minutes, I believe, uh, every day. And um, mainly recommending walking, something that everybody can do. Um, anything that I'm missing that she might have shared on that topic? Anything like that? Okay, so I'm going to pull up. Hold on one second because I practiced. I know last week I was terrible at this sharing, but Dr. White did send me a follow up that I'm going to share with you guys and desktop share. And it is this right here. And I believe you guys can see my screen. Yes. And um, it's research fresh. And this was February, March of 2021. Okay, so this is current. And um, right here move away from dementia specifically this area I highlighted it says we know from a number of studies that regular that regular physical activity may be one of the most important things you can do to promote brain health um says marwin sabah md faa and director of cleveland clinics louisville center for brain health in las vegas and yet he adds it's also a hard sell among his patients and their families. Um, he goes, I am still surprised by how deeply ingrained sedentary behavior is in many of my patients' lives. He says, when I encourage them to start walking or try yoga or a senior aerobics class, many roll their eyes. This message, it says the message from the neurological community, stop rolling those eyes and start moving. So um, 
I thought very significant as of this year, this month, fresh research, it's there, you know, and, and you guys are moving. You know, I know that for a fact, cause I see you, I'm part of that process. Um, but think about family members, think about friends, you know, think about those that are around you that, you know, may have more of a sedentary life and um, how to encourage them, how to motivate them. Not an easy task to do, not an easy task to do at all. Very, very challenging, especially if it's a close family member. Um, there's a lot of um, dynamics that we have to take in consideration. But for ourselves, we know that we're on the right path. We continue moving. We are working that brain health. We're working to um, pr uh, not prevent, but work on that plasticity of the brain, which is what we want. Um, any thoughts or comments on what you just saw right now or just what we're just read? Sorry. Yes, ma'am, Diane. Where is that article? That article is in a publication that she receives. It's called Brain and Life Mace Feature. Brain and Life Mace Feature. I can you, email that article. Please. Yeah, let me make a notation. You know what I'll do is I'll put it in the, um, the Fitnatics. I'll email it to you and I'll post it on the Fitnatics. Okay. No problem. Any comments about that particular statement that I just shared? Anyone? Oh, we are a quiet little bunch today. <laughs> That's fine. That's not a problem. You don't have to share. I'm glad that you're here to listen. Um, another thing that Dr. White spoke about was um, the caregivers, those individuals that are around that are taking care of those individuals that are Alzheimer, um, any neurological stroke. Um, and the other one was uh, stroke, Alzheimer, and what am I missing? I'm missing one other one. Uh, what was that, June? Dementia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if anyone would like to share, do you have a friend, a family member that has um, or is dealing with any of those neurological disorders? And if you'd like to share, that'd be great. If not, I understand. I understand. Yes, ma'am, Nancy. Well, I finished eating my cheese. I, um, <laughs> I had my friend, our friend Mary, who was going to join today, but today is her birthday. And her husband, I don't know that he has dementia. He has a lot of health issues. And she said, she texted me about 11.15 and said she was going, she was going to miss the day's Zoom because He's going to take her to breakfast, but his rooster hasn't crowed yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so That's she Mary. has to, you know, I know, you know, you know, she, uh, he basically sits, sits around all day long mm -hmm. and they were fortunate enough to get their COVID vaccine, but a place that he didn't have to get out of the car. I didn't ask her today, how in the heck is he going to take you to breakfast when he won't even walk from the car to get his vaccine. But I think, uh, it's very stress. It's stressful on her, but she has a, a an attitude that there's only so much she can do, and she will fight for him. And she's recently had to fight about his medications with the nurse and getting him uh, renewed. Um, I told her she needs to do it online. That's how we do it. You know, they don't have to deal with any particular person. But a lot of it, she just does what she can, and then she has to let the rest of it go because. She's she's really it for him, and um, you can only, you have to do what you can do, but then you have to come to a point where you say, "I can't do any more. It's too much for me." Mm -hmm. Yep, you're right, Nancy. You're right. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, any other uh, one would like to share? Either someone that they know of. I know uh, Mary is a as a friend of Nancy and also of mine, so I'm familiar with her and her situation. Um, in talking with Dr. White in part of that interview, one of the questions that was submitted to me from you guys, I think it was Marianne in particular, was how do you, when you go see your, your general physician, your GP, you know, whether it's a spouse or yourself, how do you advocate? How do you let them know like, hey, wait a minute, I'm forgetting a lot or I'm not sure. Is it is it just normal or are we going to an area where I need to kind of get a little bit more testing done? And uh, what Dr. White said was what stayed with me because essentially back to what Nancy was saying is that we need to be advocates 
for our family members, for our spouses, for our kids, for you know our, our siblings, whatever the case may be, because there's a lot of dynamics involved. And um, part of that process is it does engage us, not just physically, mentally, but also emotionally, because we're not medical providers. You know, how do we know what the signs of dementia are? Or, you know, how, how do we deal with Alzheimer's? What are the signs? How do you treat it? Is it just my husband saying the same thing over again? Is he just trying, is he just frustrating me? Is he just, you know, not utilizing his brain capacity to recall something? Or is there something more going on there? So it takes us as individuals, whether it's a spouse, a sibling or a child to have an awareness and to ask the questions and to educate ourselves. And yes, that does take effort. It does take energy, um, but it's a necessity for this whole system for, to come together. When you do have someone that you are caring for, when you are a caregiver, you don't always have the, all the answers. So I was glad to talk to Dr. White to find out what resources are available? You know, how do we handle that? The, and Nancy hit the nail on the head, stress. Stress is humongous. And everyone deals with stress differently. Some people eat. They eat when they're stressed. And, um, you know, and that is not healthy when it goes overboard. You know, some people drink. Some people, you know, don't eat. So there's different behaviors that we have um, for whatever the reason to manage and deal with stress. So it's very important for not just the individual with a, a particular uh, situation, whether it's Alzheimer's, stroke or dementia, but for the actual caregiver to care for themselves. And I know it sounds very odd because you're thinking, when do I have time? There's only 24 hours in the day. I need 36 hours in the day. You know, there's not enough time to do it for this, for my husband, my spouse or my wife and also take care of myself and also work if I'm still working. There's you know a lot going on. Yes, yes, the 36 hour day. You're right, thank Every you. Day. All right, yes. <laughs> what did you gained from that book, Cindy? What, what did, uh, what stuck More with you? More from the counseling sessions and then this just backs it up. And you know, it talks about fatigue and stress and that you can only do so much, you know, to Nancy's point. The financial, Dr. White also mentioned that, you know, along with, the medical, the emotional, the physical, everything. There's a financial component to all of this that, you know, should not be ignored. It exists, you know, like Cindy said, you know, she did the research, I know she did looking, and there's certain things that insurance will cover and will not cover. And so, you know, planning for those types of situations, not something that we wanna talk about, I'm sure, and have those conversations. However, very important moving forward so that when the time comes, there's a, it doesn't mean that, oh, everything's good, but at least there's some, you know, part of you that feels like, okay, you know, we talked about it, we have a plan, um, you know, now it's time to, you know, put that plan into action. And um, not just in terms of financially, but other aspects of, you know, what do you prefer? What do you think would be good? What do you feel about this? What do you think about this? It's a conversation that I want as a result of this situation that I want to have with my parents. Uh, I, I think, you know, I have siblings, I have a brother and a sister, and I think it would be smart of us as a family to have, you know, a dialogue, uh, not what this is tomorrow, but have a dialogue and find out what do you think? What would you like? Um, and then, you know, the, my brother and sister talking to them, you know, Life is going to move on. We all are going to continue to age. We all are going to get older. Um, things do change. But what are your thoughts? What do you feel comfortable with? What would you like? Do you, you know, things of that and having those conversations now when it's you're not in the thick of it, when emotions are high and you know, stress levels are high, it's a very different conversation than when you're having it, you know, you know, when you don't need to be in it at that time. Any thoughts about that? Did anyone have those types of conversations with someone? Go for it, Nancy. I've had to, I have dealt with this in one way or another three times. My father had uh, ALS, amyloidic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. Fortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, he was a very good mathematician and he started to plot his deterioration. And he knew, and he also knew that my mother was not, was being unable to take care of him because with ALS, you lose your uh, extremities, your mind stays strong. So he, he said he wanted to go to the nursing home and where they lived, they had two nursing homes. There were no other options like assisted living or anything like that. 
So uh, he went to the assisted nursing home. He actually took his truck and had somebody put a uh, hydraulic lift on the back of it. And every morning, my mother would go up to the nursing home, take the wheelchair, strap him in the back of the truck. It was only a mile or less to their house. Take him home in the morning. He would stay there until he had his scotch and water at night and she would drive him back. And it was only about six, six weeks. So uh, he was um, he was happy because he uh, he had dealt with my mother's parents. Neither one of them would go. They had lived in Fort Worth and they my parents lived in South Texas. They wouldn't go in the nursing home and it was very difficult. And he was actually happy because he had somebody to take care of him there. He made he was always very friendly, made friends there. My mother, he died in uh, 20, 1984. My mother died in 2001. She had lung cancer. And she uh, was very reluctant about getting treatment. And so it got too bad, too fast. And she was starting to be on morphine. And I said, Mom, you, I didn't live in the town. I was up there a lot. But I said, I can't, you can't live at home and take morphine. I just, you can't. So I went to the nursing home and got her in there. And over time, she had had so much pain that she had become very bitter. She pushed everybody away. She had nobody visiting her except for church people who just felt it was their calling to do it. Her friends had gone. So she went to the nursing home. She only lasted six weeks after that. But she played the piano. She found a younger guy there who had an electric piano. The two of them played. It was probably over the last five years of her life, the last happiest six weeks of her life. Now, a lot of people don't want to go, but for her, she had pushed all of her friends away and she was forced to be around people and it made her happy. Stump's mother, who died a couple of years ago, over time, and she was in her 90s, so she was in and out of a lot of things, but she, he had, he has, he's the oldest of 11 and nine, eight, quite a few of them are still alive and kicking. And there was a lot of fight between, between them and his, some of his sisters talked his mother into not going he thought it would be better, and she ended up being alone in her house except with her daughter, again, like kind of like my mother, did not have anybody to visit with her, and I was so sad because I think she would have been so much happier, and they had the, they had the money. You're right. They cost money, but they had the money. She could have been in a home with someone, with other people, whether people are checking on you and things like that, so it's, it's I was fortunate. My, I only have one sister, and she was happy with whatever, and both my parents were happy to go. But um, if people know, it's ha it's a happy place. We, and we see people here at Blue Skies that uh, people are coming to visit you. There's people around you. You're just happier because you've got people to see you and to interact with you. When you're at home, you're going to be by yourself or with one person. Anyway, yeah. those are yeah. the other thing I wanted to say is Medicare requires the doctor to ask you, I think it's once a year questions about your mental health. So um, it's it can be embarrassing and maybe you don't wanna talk about it. When they come in and ask you, you know, are you have, how many days have you felt sad this past month or whatever they ask you that. And of course, none of us want to admit, you know, we all wanna be happy or whatever, especially when it's a doctor. Um, but I know the other day I talked to my doctor about it uh, and she said, I don't think, I think you're just like everybody else. The pandemic is causing all my patients are having a lot of anxiety. All my patients are under a lot of stress. You seem fine. If you feel like you're overwhelmed or something, you know, come back and we'll talk about it some more. But from what you told me, <laughs> you're, you're normal. <laughs> you're like, you're, so it's, it's not, it's not good, but you know, when you, you have 51 hours where you have no electricity or heat, it's cold, you know, it's awful. You get in a bad mood and it takes a long time to get over it. So my, so what I say is don't, and I wish we had a larger audience here to talk about it, but when they ask those questions, don't be embarrassed. Talk to your doctor. They're required to ask you because people our age are starting to have, you know, the doctor needs to talk to you about those kinds of things. And they can often offer you some type of help if you are feeling overwhelmed or stressed, whether you're a caregiver or just a person at home. Anyway, yeah. I'll be quiet. As a, um, as a child of aging parents, um, you know, I wonder, you know, for those of you who do have kids, have you had that conversation or would you like to have that conversation to, um, with your children so they know, you know, how to address the situation? Because I know it would relieve a lot of stress if I knew it doesn't make it feel better. I, you know, I want to make that clear. It doesn't make you feel better, but there's a sense that I think that you have that, okay, you're carrying out 
you know, what your parent, what your spouse, what your child would want you to do in certain situations. It helps the situation. Um, it relieves a little bit of that. Just when you don't know what to do and you're the one that has to make the decision for somebody else, that's a lot of stress. It's a lot of responsibility. And that stress manifests so many ways in our bodies and our minds that's not healthy. So, you know, to, to get to ask these questions now, get some feedback. I know things change and can change, but what Nancy said and what Cindy said and what Dr. White said, the social isolation, what's happening right now with the pandemic, regardless of um, uh, Alzheimer's, dementia or stroke, regardless of that, this social isolation that we're experiencing right now, not everyone has a spouse they're living with, not everyone has, you know, um, children that are in the home right now. So, it's it's major it's significant i'm very thankful that i have somebody in the home with me which is my spouse and i'm very thankful now that i have the dogs i do i couldn't imagine if i was home all day you know i need some i talk to them you know i'm talking to them and it helps it's the same thing if you're living by yourself and you don't have those interactions if you are dealing with certain situations i will say very briefly with what i saw in my own family with my father and my grandmother, his mother, um, he came from a big family as well, and they were here in San Antonio. And it was it was a struggle. The, the siblings didn't always agree with the way the treatment was taking place, who were the caregiver that came in. Oh, it was, it was always a struggle. And I remember my dad trying to be the one that would organize, okay, well, you know, this, this week you would come by. This week, you're going to do the medications and no one wanted to be told what to do, when to go, how to do things. And it was always just almost conflict um, because my grandmother did not want to go to a nursing home. She wanted to be at home. So they tried their very best to get everyone to facilitate that. But in the meantime, it put a lot of stress, not just on her children, but her children's families. So, um, you know, that's, there's different things that can happen, of course, but, and there's different ways that we can deal with it, but the, no, and that's the whole purpose of the fitnatics. The more that we know, the more that we know, the better off we are and can make better decisions, not just for ourselves, but for our families, our siblings, for our friends. So I, I really always know that knowledge is power, power to do better, power to do better for ourselves and those around us. Any, any um, comments on anything? Yes, ma'am, go for it, Joan. Um, this makes me realize how fortunate I am because with my parents, they were very clear about what they wanted. They had already bought their, their, um, the pre-burial stuff mm -hmm. so that when they die, that, yeah, bye, it's great. When they died, all I had to do was go to the funeral home and pick an urn. Everything else was taken care of. It cost like 40 bucks because they paid for everything else. They were very clear about what they wanted. And so all I had to worry about was medical stuff. Do they have the right caregivers? Are they getting the right medical care? Because everything else, they were very clear. We, we want this, we don't want this. And sometimes it was hard because my sister was sure they needed 24 hour caregivers. And my father said, and I quote, if someone comes into my house who I don't invite, I'm gonna throw them out and there's nothing you can do about it. So I was like, all right, at least you're clear. Yeah, And my mother fell and life got terrible for a while and then she got a caregiver, but I at least knew. And so I think the conversation's like really helpful and any kind of pre stuff you can do for your kids, like the long-term care insurance, the pre-burial stuff, and then you don't have to worry about the money when the money and becomes a will and the, the will. will with the, the will. what you want done. If you get, you don't put me on the life support do not resuscitate mm -hmm. well the, that you do yeah. at the time but the if you're really sick and they're going to put life support you're saying no more than six months or oh. you know yeah the living I'm, will and the regular will all that stuff made my life much easier so yeah. i didn't realize how fortunate i was until i'm listening to all of you but it really did make my life easier I just had my one little focus, personal care and medicine, and they took care of everything else. Wow, Joan, thank you for sharing that. That's great. Like I said, you know, um, because going through that, you know, with a spouse or uh, a parent, 
we're human. It's, it's impactful. We have emotions, you know, and, you know, at the same time of having the emotions, having to make those types of decisions or, you know, maybe some of us are not very good decision makers. Let's be honest, you know, not everyone makes the right decision and we're under stress. And so having these conversations is good. I'm glad that, you know, we're coming to that and can have conversations with spouses or parents or kids and um, being open to it, being open to it. Anybody, any other feedback? Cause I wanna share, uh, show you guys something. And these are the resources that uh, Dr. White shared with us. So this is um, her website, Dr. White's with UT Health. And you guys, can you see the uh, screen? Okay, good, good, good. And um, great website. It does give a, it does provide support um, for those caregivers. And what I wanted to share with you guys was this viewing all the events. And from my knowledge, because I looked at it quite a few of them, the, most of them, if not all of them, are virtual. But check out this one. It's, it is virtual. It's Essentials of Caregiving Toolkit, um, a resource fair. So it might have been something like back in the day, Cindy, that when you were looking for resources, this would have been, you know, something good to have. And like I said, maybe not for yourself, but you may have a friend or you may have, you know, a, uh, your sister's husband, you know, somebody in your group that could utilize some of these resources. And um, so this is, like I said, virtual. And let me see, because I, I would imagine that it's free, but we'll see. This one is specific to San Antonio SA Amigos Memory Care um, for March. And what they do is they play games, they sing songs, they do art together, not just the individual, but the caregiver and the individuals. They work together on some of these activities. So I thought that was awesome. One thing that Dr. White does, and I don't believe it's on here, but she does on her own as part of her support group, is um, she has a choir. And so with the individuals that have the neurological disorders, as well as their caregivers, and they meet on Zoom and um, they do their best, they sing songs, you know, they utilize instruments. And um, of course, it's not as, as strategic as we hear this sound and that sound. It's everybody once again community you know so we're not alone we see other faces we hear other voices very very important um let's see now this one in april 8th talking about what we talked about the financial aspect this what's covered on uh what's covered understanding your benefits medicare and medicaid you know good information to learn it's out there you may not need it right now um, you don't know when you'll need it, but you may have somebody in your group that would benefit from it. Uh, another one, this one's understanding adult protective services and guardianship. These are things that, you know, when you're in the thick of it, you're like, what do I do? What do I do? They are resources. There are people that are out there to support you. Um, uh, you change screens right there where you're pointing the caregiver support group. That's what I went to, the WellMed Charitable Foundation Caregiver SOS Program. And so they had a big seminar at Oblate that I went to, and then they have monthly things um, at Grace House and other places around San Antonio that are great. And so that was right there on that list. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So right here, Active Daily Living. Um, so they have a newsletter, good, good, good. Um, yeah, so look at this right here. That are you a caregiver? Do you take time out of your schedule to go with the loved one to the doctor? Some of you may, some of you may not. Make sure your spouse has or is taking the correct medications. These are the responsibilities of a caregiver that along with your own responsibilities that you are responsible for. Um, do you help the parent or the sibling to manage the finances? That's another aspect. Things that you don't, you're just thinking dementia. But what about the medication? What about the finance? What about the responsibilities? What is there a vehicle? How are we going to handle it? Does that person drive anymore? Things of that nature that we don't really think about. Um, let's see. Oh, that's very cool. No cost to caregivers. So great resources. So Cindy, oh, was it kind of this caregiving coaching? Maybe was that something? Ah, and then there's a teleconnection. So calling. Ah, oh, stress busting program. That sounds pretty interesting. Learn how to manage stress and develop coping skills for your loved one with Alzheimer's or other dementia or chronic illnesses. So it's not just specific to dementia or Alzheimer's, uh, other chronic illnesses. Very good. 
All right, let me go back here. And so this was off of the Caring for the Caregiver UT Health. Another resource that Dr. White mentioned was the Family Caregiver Alliance. And this is their website. And they had various languages and resources, Chinese, Spanish, Vietnamese, um, caring for another and caring for yourself. That's what I really liked about this because it, um, it takes into account both the individual and the caregiver. And you obviously have different needs. Um, I went to this one earlier. So caring for yourself, you know, the grief, the loss, the emotional, the self-care, making sure that we are, you know, taking care of ourselves, our hair, we're washing ourselves, you know, things that you may not think, but when you've got a thousand things going on, you're like, oh, you know, do I really need to do that? Clipping your nails, making sure, you know, things like that. Spirituality, Cindy mentioned that, um, huge. And that goes along with what I said is that, you know, having someone in your group that you feel that you can share with and you can lean on or just talk to um, your overall health. I'm sure that has to do with nutrition as well. What you're putting in your body, uh, relaxation and meditation. What would you enjoy doing? Closing your eyes, listening to meditation, praying, you know, ways to calm yourself. And then the stress, how do you manage stress um, and how can you better manage your stress? Because we can always improve um, if the, uh, the strategies we're doing right now are not working for us. So another very, very good website for resources. They too also have events, Caregiving 101. Uh, and I'm gonna assume that um, they are uh, virtual, which is amazing which is awesome. How great is that, that we can get this support from, you know, individuals that have, you know, the resources, have the knowledge um, that we can reach them, you know, rather than having to drive somewhere, find a place to park. Is this the place? What time? You know, it's a lot easier to have these uh, resources available to us virtually. So um, another good website to look into or to share. And then the last one, since this is the military town, um, we have the VA also has a caregiver support program. And they also have resources here um, for uh, caregivers. So I definitely want you guys to be aware of that. Once again, not just for you, but for someone else who could benefit from it. I think very, very important. Um, there's a caregiver dementia video series, a toolkit, suicide prevention for caregivers, because yes, that, that level of responsibility, um, if not, if you don't know how to handle that or manage it, don't have a support, don't have the faith, don't have the, um, the skills to manage stress, we get buried literally and figuratively um, because it's a lot. It's a lot. No one, you don't take that course in school or in college, you know how to do that. You just don't. Okay. Um, so definitely wanted to share that with you. Let me take that out. Any, um, any last words, thoughts, uh, you'd like to share or. Oh, the other Sorry. benefit of the virtual class is that one that said caregiver 101, it takes place in the San Francisco Bay area. Well, I would not be able to attend, but I could go to this one online. Yes, exactly. Would, you know, um, not that we don't have the resources here in San Antonio, but physicians and, and nurses that specialize in you know, support groups and know, you know the research that's taking place, I think that's humongous to have that uh, ability to connect with those individuals in the professional level. Thank you, Cindy. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns? Oh, you guys are really, really quiet as mice today. Thank you, thank you for holding this. <laughs> I um, I will post the um, the interview I did with Dr. White on the fit, uh, Fitnatics. I'll also post the uh, the websites that I shared with you guys on my face group group. If you are part of that, great. Um, let me think. What else? I was considering. Um, sending the information out to you guys via email as well um but I'm not sure about that because i know not everybody is on social media so that's an option as well if you want some specific information reach out to me i'll send it to you um i just don't want to stuff your your inbox with loads of, of emails so 
I do want to thank you guys for your input, for your time. And I definitely want to continue to get some topics that really, you know, resonate, that um, are helpful. I will say that tomorrow I will be doing a one-on-one -on -one interview with a nurse. She's an oncology nurse and her specialty is weight loss for women over 50. So I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be interviewing her because I want to find out, you know, what's going on, talking about um, hormones, menopause, things, you know, what's her methodology, you know, what makes her successful in helping women um, with weight loss. So next week's topic is going to be uh, skincare, skincare regimens, Ooh. skincare. Okay. Yeah. All right, guys. I'll see y'all later. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.